Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Oncology Data Advisor. Today, we're having this episode in honor of World Humanitarian Day, which is held on August 19th. I'm joined by Dr. Alankrita Tanasia and Dr. Matt Hadfield, who are going to delve into this day some more. Thanks so much for coming on again today. Thank you so much, Kara. Uh, I can I can get us started off by just sort of explaining the background of uh, Humanitarian Day. So on August 19th of each year, we celebrate World Humanitarian Day. And the purpose is to raise awareness uh, of the plight of civilians around the world who have become caught up in conflicts and also honor their, and raise support for humanitarian workers who are at risk and sometimes lose their lives. Um, which is an unfortunate and terrible thing. Um, currently, over 130 million people throughout the world are currently in cri caught up in crisis, uh, secondary to war, natural disasters, and are in desperate need of humanitarian aid. Uh, just to provide a little history, World Humanitarian Day was established in 2008 by the UN uh, General Assembly and was first officially celebrated in 2009. Um, and the date of uh, 19th of August was chosen as it marks the anniversary of uh, the unfortunate bombing of the Canal Hotel in Baghdad, an event in which the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, Sergio Vieira, De uh, Malat, and the 20 others uh, lost their lives. So uh, a little bit of a somber uh, remembrance, but such an important topic to, to start talking about today. And the theme of the 2024 World Humanitarian Day uh, campaign is um, focusing on addressing the alarming rise of attacks against humanitarian workers and civilians, advocating for enforcement of international humanitarian law and to in, uh, end impunity for these violations. Um, and I, I guess, uh, Alan Credo, we could, we could get started. Um, you know, right before we, we, we joined the podcast, we were kind of chatting about violence against healthcare workers, uh, obviously a, a horrible situation, um, which it, it sounds like, you know, when you did your medical training in India, this was something that was relatively common. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about that, both against physicians in India and maybe humanitarian workers and how this impacts uh, patients and physicians everywhere. Right. So I think that, uh, you know, over the last few years, especially with the advent of social media, um, a lot of, uh, you know, very sad uh, incidents uh, came to light, wherein healthcare workers, you know, interns, nurses, doctors were actually attacked by patients um, in clinics, you know, in hospitals, things like that. And several of these incidents actually came to light. Uh, a lot of these videos were circulated on social media. And it brought out a very sad reality, uh, you know, wherein, you know, healthcare workers, uh, especially, you know, for instance, in the last few years when COVID, the pandemic hit and everyone's working over time and, you know, essentially we are humanitarian in some ways, you know, we wish to help people and, you know, we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, safety precaution, you know, in, in clinics, uh, you know, we, this is not expected that we're going to be attacked by patients. And, you know, we end up having horrible injuries, some people, you know, bed bound for several days, some people lose their lives because of attacks by patients. And uh, even today, there is no um, real, you know, safety regulations against physicians, for example, you know, there's, there, there are no security officers guarding uh, doctors in their offices. And, you know, the, this is, this just goes out to say how much in need uh, you know the uh, the doctors uh, and healthcare providers all over the world are as well for you know consideration uh, in in you know in the, in the theme for example for the uh, world humanitarian day is um, you know, to protect us and, you know, to protect people who want to help others. So, you know, just wanted to bring it out there. I, I'm aware of these incidents in India, but Matt, do you think there are so, so, such incidents in the United States as well that you could think of? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think you raised such a, a great point and, and thanks for sharing that. I, I think um, it's really important in the context of medicine to think about um, the humanitarian aid that's so necessary for providing care to patients all around the world. Um, I know in my own experience, I, I did uh, an away rotation in West Africa working at a hospital that was largely funded and staffed by humanitarian physicians, nurses, technicians, um, and uh, violence against these types of workers discourages people from entering you know, these types of roles and, and ultimately limits care to millions of people around the world that, that rely on it. And an unfortunate recent example of you know, humanitarian workers uh, that, that got caught up in, in the violence of the local climate uh, was uh, Davy and Natalie Lloyd, who were humanitarian workers in, in Haiti. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, as we know, Haiti has been, you know, sprung into violence in the last several months uh, with the transition of their government. And, uh, and they were unfortunately, uh, and, and horribly murdered um, by local gangs. So like, when, when humanitarians go into these types of situations, they're going uh, with the, the guise of helping the local population, but they do unfortunately, incur a significant amount of risk. Um, but as you mentioned, 
um, and, and as we both practice medicine in the United States, uh, we're not immune to those types of situations as well. Um, you know, we certainly have had situations, uh, myself personally, I've had situations where patients become violent, um, patients have become abusive, both verbally uh, and physically against uh, staff. Unfortunately, um, not only physicians, but oftentimes nurses, um, technicians, medical assistants are, are, are caught up in this. And um, I, I know we're talking about humanitarian workers and on World Humanitarian Day, but, um, you know, we're all serving that mission of, of trying to take good care of patients. And I, I think, um, unfortunately, these things do happen. Yeah, and it's really sad. And, you know, I hope that uh, a message goes out on this day on our behalf to, you know, consider these issues as well. And, you know, as physicians, um, you know, to have our to have safety measures in place for us as well, especially in countries like India, you know, South Africa and things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's so critical. And just to reiterate that, you know, outside inside the united states there are several areas that are underserved that will rely on humanitarian aid um you know in the form of volunteers but uh, around the world there's there's millions of people in need of this care and um violence against these types of workers again limits the the amount of people going into them i think uh because we're both oncologists uh one thing that kind of struck me about world humanitarian day sort of thinking more globally is just how much cancer has changed in the last 10 to 15 years so with the advent of targeted therapies with whole exome sequencing, our understanding of the immune system, which I think we're just in the early stages of really understanding how to harness the immune system, um, really raises the question that we were speaking about before, you know, with all these new therapies, including immune checkpoint inhibitors, targeted therapies, whole exome sequencing, uh, augmenting some of these things, as well as um, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, by specific antibodies, all really amazing, cool stuff that we love talking about all the time. But it does make you wonder how uh, much we can actually extrapolate those amazing advances in the industrialized world to the greater global community as a whole. Because to me, it seems very, very unlikely that the rest of the world will catch up to these remarkably complex therapies um, for many, many years if at all, unless we start thinking a little bit more critically about how to bring those life-altering and prolonging therapies to those patient populations. So I'm not sure, you had mentioned that you've had some experience with this in India, so I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, Matt, absolutely. And, you know, this is something that I think I resonate with deeply, especially, you know, actually more so in the last few months wherein I've had just, uh, you know, for example, uh, just just people in, you know, the locality uh, from India, you know, talk to me about their relatives who had kidney cancer. And, you know, kidney cancer uh, in the United States, when, it, you know, I specialize more in hematological malignancy, especially multiple myeloma. However, you know, the kidney cancer patients that I've seen in fellowship, uh, they were all, you know, it was one of the good good cancers to have, you know, like, you know, most of them are, um, you know, resolved with surgery. And, um, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of advent in the field of immunotherapy for kidney cancer in the last few years. And, you know, several papers in the metastatic as well as the adjuvant setting for immunotherapy. And uh, it's it's a really like a no brainer that we would you know use immunotherapy for these patients these days. And there are some of the older toxic TKIs that can cause you know a lot of side effects, but they're definitely more uh, they're cheaper and uh, you know more available. And um, they're oral pills, so I think are more easy to less healthcare costs you know involved with going to the hospital, administrating and things like that. So I re I learned recently that in India immunotherapy is not available for kidney cancer. And a lot of patients are still, uh, I mean, most of the patients are still getting TKIs unless they can, you know, go to a hospital that can get these imported from the United States, you know, immunotherapy for them. And even then, it's really expensive. It's about, uh, you know, each cycle of treatment is worth uh, three lakh uh, Indian rupees, uh, which I think is about. 2000 US dollars, if I'm right. not wrong, for, and they pay out of their pocket. And, you know, we talk about 2000 US dollars, but in India, that's still, you know, the, the it's still a lot of, it's still a lot of money, 3, 000, 3 lakh rupees is a lot of money. And a lot of people, most Indians cannot afford this kind of money. And, uh, you know, that just uh, made me realize about, you know, how much disparity there is in, you know, what is considered standard of care in the United States versus, you know, total luxury in India for something, you know, of the nature of kidney cancer where people can live longer, you know, it's a disease where people can have 
a lot of longevity and you know prolonged uh, disease free uh, survival rates and things like that so you know my heart went out to uh, you know lower like countries like india where and you know or i'm sure most of the world apart from the united states you know could agree to that that you know, these treatments even though we're spending so much money in research and you know um there's so many trials on these in the last few years and you know a lot of people are doing more and more research in in these fields but are we really helping out the you know the world or are we only you know helping being able to help out a, a few people you know in, in uh, some uh, you know uh, let me say privileged countries i don't know if that's the right word to say but you know i, I think that the, on this day we should also think about these things and think about how we can uh, have more equitable cancer care you know globally as well as i'm sure there's disparities in the united states as well you know for instance we talk about disparities in trials and you know the kind of people we are enrolling and you know sometimes even academic centers versus community centers like for instance uh, for multiple myeloma car t cell therapies were only available in a few centers and even now they're trying to make it more outpatient but some people being treated in the community still have difficulties getting it so you know equitable care is definitely something that we could you know think about on this day and highlight and think about how we can improve going forward no it's such a remarkable perspective to hear that um i mean if you if you think about it not being able to use immunotherapy for renal cell carcinoma which is you know as you mentioned one of the frontline options that we use um pretty remarkable given the state of how we manage that here in the United States. But also even more interesting about your anecdotal story is, um, you know, for the few people who have the resources to get these drugs, you know, imported from another country, you're still being administered by a team that largely doesn't give them. So, you know, we're giving drugs that have a, a remarkably different side effect profile than anything we've given in the past and, and, and really is its own evolving field on its own and immunotherapy toxicities. But then you know, you're giving it to patients who, you know, the team taking care of them may not understand those toxicities very well or have any experience with those toxicities. And I think that's one of the things that concerns me a little bit about subcutaneous checkpoint inhibitors is it may allow for more widespread de dissemination, but we still need the resources uh, just as we would with pill or CRS monitoring for my specific antibodies. You, you know, it has to be a whole healthcare team to take care of these patients. So it's a it's a it's a big problem that I don't think we'll be able to solve today, but I, I think we do need to think more globally because we can't keep to your point, we can't keep developing therapies that are remarkably uh, complicated, promising, um, but ultimately just for people that are, you know, as you mentioned, privileged and, and um, fortunate enough to receive them. So it's a it's a big, big issue that I think we're going to have to think about a little bit more. Right. And I think the stakeholders need to be involved as well. So. Uh, you know, this, these are just thoughts that we need to think about and definitely, you know, talk about so that our voices can reach the stakeholders. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great way to, to end our discussion on World Humanitarian Day. I think, you know, we would certainly hope that, you know, violent acts against humanitarian workers, in, in, including healthcare professionals around the world and in the U.S. are, are you know, um, policied against and, and 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 hindered so that we can continue giving care around the world. And um, I think we do need to think a little bit more critically about how to bring access of more novel therapies to patients around the world. That's an important question.